So uh, next up, uh, we have Dr. Natalia de Leon uh, from the Department of Agronomy here at UW-Madison. Um, she received her master's and PhD in plant breeding and plant genetics from right here at UW-Madison and did a postdoc at Michigan State University. Um, she worked in the commercial sector for approximately two years before coming back to UW Madison as a faculty member. And she's currently affiliated uh, with the De Department of Agronomy and the Plant Breeding and Plant Genetics program here. Uh, her research program focuses on integrating different sources of information to accelerate translational research for enhanced crop productivity. Uh, specifically focusing in on maize. And the title of her talk is Big Data in Plant Science, the UW Maize Breeding and Genetics Program. So please uh, help me welcome Dr. De Leon. And um, I have to say, if you remember at the beginning of today, Chris talked about a neighbor uh, office mate that speaks very loud in, in a different language yours truly. So uh, hopefully it's not going to feel like that to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'll try my best. So um, the title is Big Data in Plant Science. And uh, the idea here is just to relate um, some of the work that we have been doing uh, here at UW. Uh, in the theme here, um, I think I hope to transmit is that this is really a, a true collaboration uh, with all the uh, presentations that we had throughout the day. I think it's becoming clear that with the amount of data, the key uh, thing that we should all be very aware of is the fact that we depend on each other and across all these disciplines to actually get our work done. And um, I am the one presenting here again because I am the loudest, um, because <laughs> uh, Sean Pepper could have been here, just might as well and done a much better job. But um, So this is a, a 10 plus year collaboration uh, between Professor Kepler and I, both from the Department of Agronomy on campus. So I will talk about three main topics. I'll try to describe um, Chris and, and Claudio um, ask that to, to make sure that uh, since it's such, this is such a wide um, uh, audience in terms of expertise that we spend some time describing what is it that we do. And then I'll try to really use one example to describe some of the work that we are do, doing um, on applying different kinds of data sets to our work. And then I'll finish up with one specific example of a project that we're working on where we are actually applying these uh, in the field. So what, what is it that we do? Um, the focus of our work is under, understanding plant phenotypes. And plant phenotypes are um, the result of the effect of the genotypic, uh, the genes and derivatives from genes in the genome that uh, are plants that grow in certain environments. And then uh, the, there is this interaction between genotypes and environments. So if we think about, for example, yield as a phenotype, we have uh, the central dogma of, of biology where DNA is transcribed into uh, RNA that then become proteins. And somehow that um, is, is uh, represented in the different phenotypes. The picture here is a map of the United States. And the different colors are um, examples of ranges of temperature, precipitation, um, in different climatic conditions that affect the environments where these plants are going to be grown. And that's what the E represents. And then there is this relationship that um, environments affect plants in different ways, uh, where we have environments of situations of uh, high stress, overall you will tend to see a lower performance of the genotypes that you're evaluating. And in situations of uh, low stress, you will tend to see higher performance of the majority of the genotypes. But then sometimes you have these funky relationships where um, certain genotypes are affected by environments in slightly different ways. And a lot of the time, um, we spend uh, trying to understand what are the factors, what is the response in the plants that makes these interactions not follow the expected rules. And this is important because when we are trying to use genotypic information to predict phenotypes, this is what really throws us uh, off. So from the standpoint of the genotypes, the cost of generating genotypic information keeps going down. Back in 2001, which wasn't that long ago, uh, a megabase of DNA will cost about $10,000. Today, less than a tenth of a dollar. And it continues to go down. Um, well, maybe here, maybe not. 
Maybe this is the end of the talk. No. <laughs> I can keep talking, but you're not going to like it. Is that working? Oh, there you go. Now we go. Um, the environment, is, as I said, is the vehicle in which we evaluate these genotypes. And the key word in here, I think, is uh, relevant. Um, then we have these uh, interactions of genotype by environments. And one of the things that uh, we are trying to do with uh, the advances of technologies is identify traits that actually help us um, identify what, how this interaction occurs and if we can predict it in a more informative way. Instead of just looking at the global response of EO, can we partition uh, this complex trait in pieces so we can do a better job of understanding this interaction. And then um, the phenotype, which um, is the end, end point of where we want to get. But as a biologist, we have to um, also always remember that you can get to a phenotype through many different ways. So we, we need to um, try to understand what is the most efficient way for a certain plant to express a phenotype. In order to combine all this information, this is very much a numbers game. And that's where a field like plant breeding and plant, plant genetics and plant improvement becomes a big data field. Because the more data we have to try to extrapolate all this information, the better off will be uh, the results that we obtain. This slide over here is just to, sh to um, take a minute to say that despite the complexities of all these phenomena, the genotype, the environment, the interactions of genotype and environment, uh, plant breeding is an incredibly successful endeavor. So what you've seen here, and you have seen um, other versions of the same graph earlier today, is uh, the increases in green yield um, in the United States since the mid-1800s. And on average, in the United States, uh, grain yield increases between 1 and 1.5 percent per year. So being a plant breeder is living in a constant state of, of uh, rush. For every year that a particular variety is delayed in its release, that variety has to be 1 to 1.5 1 1 percent better than it was the year before. And so it is a race uh, that, uh, that is constantly trying to make this process more efficient. So um, just to illustrate what plant breeding is in kind of a slide, in the traditional way, uh, phenotypic selection or breeding is you look at this particular plant over here that produces these fruits, and if uh, big, round, red fruits are the favor of a phenotype, um, what breeders will do is look at these plants, pick the ones that have big, red fruits, recombine, uh, advance, cross them, and advance them until they produce a better product after a few generations of, of breeding. The new generation of um, uh, selection, which is called, also called genomic selection, takes advantage of the information that we have in the genome where a G in a position in the DNA tends to be associated with red big fruits and other base pairs are associated with other phenotypes. And instead of just looking at so many plants in the field, we use that particular information to make the process more efficient. We train models to tell us that every time we see a G in that particular position, there is a much higher likelihood that the products that we are going to get from it will be more like what we are interested in versus the ones that don't have the G in that particular model. So we use this information to, instead of evaluating so many plants in the field, make the process faster and more efficient and hopefully still get to where we want to get. Of course, this is a complete oversimplification because nothing is as simple as this, but um, it never likes a good, a good illustration. So um, the simplest part of the process, or you know, when we put these pictures that show the, sorry about that, uh, the pictures of the DNA up here, the A's and the T's, even that part that in the picture looks so simple, um, it is much more complex. And this is, we are going into the details of, uh, of uh, the biology behind here. There has been a lot of studies that can, uh, have shown that, for example, the genome of maize, um, you have regions in, in the genome where whole chunks of the chromosome don't exist. So two embed lines, two maize embed lines, happy and, and looking beautiful, will have, uh, some of them will have this big section of three megabases of DNA present in chromosome six, and the neighbor right next to them will not have it. And it's not 
um, again, it's, it's not a, a simple polymorphism. It's whole regions of the genome that might be present in some lines and not the others. So even when we are talking about the simplest um, getting ideas for the sequence of the DNA, there is a lot of variability that we need to account for. And so just, again, just one brief example from the kind of data that we generate in our program. We have uh, some collections of diverse materials, collections of 900 diverse inbred lines that we collected RNA from seedling tissue. And we, um, for each of those individuals, we generated about 20 million reads. Um, each read is about 100 base pairs. So you can imagine the amount of data generated for each individual, multiply that by uh, 900 and the kinds of uh, genotypic data files that are handled. These um, uh, types of experiments, like the one I just described, are, are run by the biotech center here at the University of Wisconsin on a very regular basis. And you, they will tell you when you talk to, to them, and uh, Josh might be here in the audience as well, he, um, they produce large amounts of genotypic information. The technologies keep updating um, almost month after month. And even though they have large capacity for storage in, in, um, in running of all these different uh, uh, algorithms and, and genotypic data, uh, they always tend to run out of capacity because of the volume that these sequencing machines are able to generate. And they keep going, uh, as I said, it seems like month after month. So what, would, what do we do? I mean, just one example. This is one diverse population, one of the many that we work with. If you have information for all these different lines, and this is work done by Candy Hirsch at the University of Minnesota when she was a postdoc here. Uh, if you take a bunch of different lines, as I said, that have different genomic structures, as I indicated before, uh, without going into the details, you will take that information and map it against a reference genome. In this case, in the case of maize, it's B73, and then identify how many of those references match with the reference genome. Things that don't match will be um, assembled again, and that information will provide some indication of regions of the genome that might be present in one line that is not present in the other, which is commonly seen in the case of maize. Uh, in this particular analysis, we had about 8,000 out of the 30-some uh, thousand loci and non maize that were new or reassembled because of the possibility of actually taking this very large data set, mapping it to a reference genome, and, and understanding how many additional regions this diverse set presents. This, this analysis took a couple of months. This was um, quite a bit ago, two years ago. Technologies advanced, but the volume of the data also advanced. Um, back in 2015, we had only one reference genome. Um, reference genomes are actually popping out uh, in the literature and in, in all over the place. So you have to imagine that if you want to do a complete understanding of the genome, you have to make the sequence analysis multiple times and comparing it to all these different reference genomes. And indeed, it is very important that we do that because we are understanding more and more about the complexity uh, of what it is. We, we tend to know a lot about these genes that are common across uh, all uh, different lines, but we are learning more about these different gene uh, sequences, what we call dispensable, that are some present in some lines but not in others, and then uh, certain regions that are actually unique to uh, specific lines. And uh, again, without going into the details, understanding the complexity of the genome that this way help us understand how these genes um, express themselves when they are exposed to different uh, environmental conditions. So um, moving on into, okay, so all the simple part of it, which is the understanding the genetic uh, geno genotypic variants of these different diverse populations, ultimately what we are interested in is how these translate into phenotypic variants. So I'm going to, um, uh, in order to do that, uh, in the work that we do, the uh, field is, is our big outdoor laboratory. What I'm showing you in here is a typical um, uh, blame breeding genetics uh, field trial. And I don't know if you can see from the back, but each one, uh, each collection of our lines of, of plants represents a row, a different variety, a different genotype. You, differ, you see different tassel colors, different um, shapes of leaves and colors. And um, typically in a, in a breeding program, we, our experimental unit would be the collection of all these plants in the row. That represents the variety that we are interested in, and it might be replicated multiple times in this environment. But nowadays, we can actually think about these fields in, in, in more dimensions than just that. 
as I said in the past, a row used to be an experimental unit and maybe we might have more than one row representing a particular genotype. But now we can actually look inside these rows instead of looking at the average performance that a combine might get by harvesting each of these rows, we can actually now focus maybe on individual plants or uh, more specifically look at components of that plant and try to understand how the changes in those different components will affect, um, ultimately affect yield, for example. So the example that I'm going to use to illustrate that today uh, is um, eel components. And uh, this is a triangle. Joe Lauer is actually in the audience, uh, um, our professor at the, uh, the Department of Agronomy as well in corn extension. And he, um, he separated the components of grain eel very nicely in this figure. Uh, but you can think about it. If you count the number of plants that you have in a field and you multiply that by the number of, uh, number of kernels that are produced and then the weight of those kernels, the multiplication of all those factors will ultimately uh, result in yield. If instead of looking at overall yield, which is a very complex and lowly inherited trait, if we can dissect that complex trait into its parts and be able to understand how environment, for example, affects each of those, we, we should be able to do a better job of improving crops. Uh, so what we are interested in is, is really measuring all these different components of the female inflorescence, such as cob, ear, and length, and width, and then the different morphological compositions of the, of the kernels. And in the past, this is the way we used to do it. We used to have a board that had um, centimeter marks in the back, and we would just take three ears and say, okay, these three cobs measure this much divided by three. On average, that would be the cob width. We now, through um, a wonderful collaboration with um, Edgar Spalding Group, uh, Nathan Miller, um, as it illustrated in the picture, uh, we developed a, a pipeline. This is, was uh, the, the collection of the ears was work that was done uh, by a grad student in our group, Nick Hayes. And um, we use flatbed scanners. Uh, collect ears from collections of diverse lines, such as the example of the uh, uh, diversity panel that I mentioned before. We plan these thousands of genotypes and replicated experiments across several years, collect three ears from each one of these rows, and then take images uh, on these flatbed scanners. And uh, Nathan and Edgar develop very elegant uh, image analysis tools that allows us to measure not only the average width, but the width across the entire length of the ear. And then, I don't know if you can see here, but the wavy line uh, that you see here allows us to measure the height of the kernel and all the different characteristics. We can also um, shell those ears, and then um, we can also get morphological characterizations for every kernel in this flatbed scanner, uh, total weight, and therefore we can estimate uh, plot weight based on this information. So this particular technology allows us to do a much better job of measuring what we measured before. These images are stored. We can continue to extract the information, and we do um, you know, now look into cup colors and other characteristics. This is extremely useful, provides very accurate information, but the most interesting part of all is that then we can do things with this information, with these uh, images that we couldn't do before. We can use different mathematical transformations of such images to then understand more what happens to the ears um, uh, in terms of the overall form using, for example, um, principal component um, analysis, both in terms of the kernel shape and the ear shape, that allows us to, to not look only at the measurements that we can get with a ruler, but get to these other derivative type measurements. So just one quick application. This is the work of one of our grad students, Mike White, where he, um, well, so and I should say that, of course, we have taken uh, all the traits that I showed before, and all these populations are genotypes, so we um, look for associations between the phenotypes and the genotypes and identifying genes that control all these traits. So we have done that for all these collections of different populations. In addition to that, we can do things that we couldn't do before. So uh, Mike White, for example, took a collection of these diverse lines and planted in a particular way, increasing the planting density within a row from low density to very high density, and then look at the response of the genotypes to these um, source of stress if you will, okay? So you, we, we um, artificially pr uh, provoke different orders of stress into these genotypes and then look at what they do um, in terms of the, uh, of, of the ear. So if the ears over here come from 
very low density planting, and then uh, year number six, six will be from very high planted in situations. So these kinds of uh, tools allows us to really understand how environment affects the different components and therefore yield ultimately. And all of this is possible because of the, um, the uh, capacity for processing that we have on this campus. So what you see here is the pipeline of how, uh, for this particular example of the ear scanning, how the data is managed um, by uh, our group in collaboration, and I should say Edgar's, uh, Nathan's group, um, are doing all of this work. So the data is collected um, in, our, in our hub. The information is sent to cybers. Uh, the data is stored in cybers and then uh, move back to, this, uh, to the UW campus through a submit node and um, through access to this wonderful resource source of the um, uh, open uh, uh, grid, we can use um, different numbers of clusters to do this analysis very quickly. Uh, and then uh, the, the resulting information is uh, sent actually back to cybers where it becomes uh, available to the public. So just as an example, um, 7,000 year images from this work generates about what terabytes of data. If it wasn't because of the amazing infrastructure that we have in terms of computation in this campus, it would have taken a very long time. We can do that in less than one day. Um, so here's the data processing and computing capabilities of this campus that we take advantage through the Center for High Throughput Computing, which again is in an amazing resource that we have. Um, I put this table in here uh, because every time I read it, it amazes me. 325 million hours uh, of service of, of this structure uh, to our campus. So an incredible resource that we have here. So the last few slides, I just want to um, show how some of the, um, the ideas that we have developed for our program um, itself is we are visualizing expanding these into um, a, a program that is looking to understand in GYE at a more global level. So the Genomes to Fields initiative is a publicly initiated and led uh, research initi initiative that is trying to coordinate and catalyze um, the utilization of genomic information to improve uh, predictive, uh, predictive phenomics. Um, and if you want more information, here's the webpage. And it has really been the consequence of the mobilization of a community that, um, I, that realized the value of all these genomic resources that are available and how we can actually use that information for crop improvement. And so this particular um, initiative, one of the main projects that are part of this initiative is actually the maize uh, genotype by environment uh, interaction project and in this project we have uh, a network of locations and what you see here are the states where uh, public plant breeding plant, uh, public maize breeders and geneticists uh, that are part of this collaboration are located in the United States so each one of these states has a site a testing site and uh, what we have in each one of these sites is a collection of uh, approximately 500 different uh, hybrids representing a very wide genetic diversity they are of course they are over Overlapping but different from north to south, uh, just because of the spread of maturities. And in each one of these sites, we collect a number of um, sort of a standard type uh, phenotypic um, data for each of the hybrids. We also have a weather station, the same weather station in each of the sites, and we collect uh, also collect uh, collect uh, collect uh, soil samples. Uh, all the materials that are used in this experiment are publicly available and they are genotyped. Um, and all this information um, is generated to become available. So the 2014-2015 data is already available in uh, 2016 is on a schedule to become available too. So for so, so far um, we have been able to collect sort of these standard type uh, traits that will help us understand uh, phenotypes on a, on a fairly uh, global type um, uh, way. But uh, one of the goals of, of, of initiative or a framework like this is to be able to apply some of these uh, phenotyping technologies to really get to the details 
of uh, GYE. So in the case of this particular experiment, if we were to think about deploying the ear scanning across the genomes to fields, uh, thinking about 500 hybrids times about 35 locations will be 17,000 plus uh, samples that need to be evaluated. We take two um, images of ears, one of calves and one of kernels for each of these um, Simple. So we are talking about something like four, 40 terabytes of data that would have to be collected every year from the ears. Um, we know we can do it because of the infrastructure that we have on campus, but this is certainly not uh, a trivial uh, project. And then the distributed nature of the incoming images create a, creates a, a number of challenges um, as well. And I provided the example of the ear scanning. You can think about doing similar things with other um, components of the plant that are important for productivity. This is work done by another very talented grad student in our group, Joe Gage. Um, he basically did a lot of the same ideas that we see did with the ears, um, the same types of things, trying to understand variability in the tassels and how they affect pollen production and therefore um, grain production. And um, you can imagine any trait. This is uh, work done by Nathan Miller. Um, we don't uh, breed for red plants. This is the image analysis software <laughs> that does that. I get that question all the time. Um, so these are rows of corn in um, a new AV uh, flying over these rows of corn in um, these uh, images are uh, taking uh, at a certain sequence, uh, at a certain sequence allows you to measure uh, growth, uh, growth uh, rate and hopefully eventually tasseling um, to determine flowering time across uh, large sets of genotypes. And why uh, these kinds of technologies are useful? Um, the, the component that um, it is very important that I, I want to kind of finish up with is that all that I mentioned before, primarily in the case of the ear evaluation and the tassel evaluation, they are components of yield and help us get to more of the details of um, a very complex trait. They are still uh, a picture of the end result of a whole year of plants or a whole season of plants exposed to the environment. Um, we know that plants throughout their development, they are affected in a number of different ways by um, all kinds of environmental um, uh, uh, effects. And so if we had the ability to, instead of just looking at the final product, the ear when it is mature or the tassel when it's um, about to shed pollen, if we could do that over time, uh, we would have created a, an additional access on the understanding of the complexity of these traits. So we have here phenotypes and genotypes, and as I mentioned before, we separate certain genotypes, uh, uh, individuals based on their genotype and try to find differences in phenotypes, uh, which allows us to create relationships between these two. But if we could do that over time, um, this additional access provides a significant amount of information, and this is only possible when you have technologies that allows you to, to get to that, to that third component. What I, um, actually, this is uh, Sean Kepler's thing, a Fitbit for plants. That's ultimately what we are all um, in, intending to do, and we heard some talks already today, this idea of being able to measure plants and the response to the environment um, as, time, uh, as time goes on. So just to wrap up um, some final take-home messages. So plant improvement is an incredibly successful endeavor despite the complexities of the system. Um, I, I need to highlight, however, that there is the law of diminishing returns. Increasing performance comes at a higher cost as time goes by. So the incorporation of technologies is not a choice, it's a need. Uh, we just have to understand what are the technologies that actually help us um, increase that, uh, that efficiency. From a genomic standpoint, um, it is relatively cheap to evaluate large numbers of individuals, so the phenotyping of these individuals is what is becoming clearly the bottleneck. Um, in, in for plant improvement, this ability of measuring intermediate stages in plant development is a very powerful, um, very powerful tool that really helps increase efficiency um, in our ability to predict performance and understand what are the biological processes that are really relevant for, for the outcomes that we are interested in. And technologies are becoming available. 
too many technologies are becoming available. It's hard sometimes to really dissect or, or understand what is it that really um, is useful. And another uh, topic that I didn't have time to touch on, but it is relevant to big data that has been mentioned before, is as you start accumulating data or uh, accumulating information across these different data sets, the possibility or the ability to create a standards, that is one of the really uh, nice things about, for example, the GYE project, where we have um, different groups coming together and measuring things in the exact same way, those data sets have um, tremendous value because of that. And um, as I alluded to, the big challenge is uh, to appropriately analyze and interpret results, this idea of data versus um, information. What we need is information. We do have a lot of data. So with that, I want to finish up by uh, thanking um, again Edgar Spalding's group, uh, Robin Buell, and uh, I didn't mention her name, but she's a bioinformatician at the University of Michigan that works with us um, quite a bit, and Candy Hirsch at the University of Minnesota, certainly the CHTC, and uh, all the Genomes to Fields collaborators and sponsors, and, um, and the different funding agencies. This is the group in Wisconsin. Uh, happy Sean Kepler here in the left corner. Uh, grad students, undergrad, some of you are here in the audience. Thank you for your hard work. I know summers can be long out in the cornfield. So uh, with that, I'll finish up and thank you for your attention. Thank you.